I think I will be remembered as the cartoonist with a drumstick through his head. Yes, I not only hear a different drummer, I am the different drummer. For more than half a century, editorial cartoonist Tom Tolles has pointed the tip of his pen toward those who wield the most power. He has marched to the beat of his own drum, while drawing for publications such as the Buffalo Courier Express, the Buffalo News, and the Washington Post. Recently, the Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist sat down with Investigative Post's Jim Heaney to talk the future of politics, journalism, and democracy. Anyway, I listen carefully now for the sound of her black slippers as I work in Herb's office. Yes, I'm afraid it won't always be Herb Black's office, no matter how long I work there, which if I follow Herb's example, will be another century and a half. But if Herb's spirit has ever whispered anything to me since I've been here, it's been, don't try to be Herb Black, be yourself. So here I am at the Library of Congress with a drumstick through my head. For Investigative Post, I'm Garrett Looker, and this is Newsmakers. So I'm here with Tom Tolles. Uh, Tom and I go back a long Always. way before yeah. I had gray hair, and I don't know why you don't have gray <laughs> hair because you're older than I am. But um, So welcome to our podcast. Great to be here, Jim. Um, so you're going from the Washington Post going on two years, right? Almost, yeah. Um, do you miss editorial cartooning? Uh, well, let me uh, back up just a minute to... Uh, to say exactly when I left the post because it was a significant date. I uh, I originally had hoped to uh, retire way back uh, the day Hillary Clinton got elected. <laughs> and yeah, when I, I saw the outcome of the election, I thought I'm here for another four years at least. And I, I left the, my last cartoon was the Sunday before the election. And then I was out. <laughs> you were out. So um, no, I have not looked back. I, I put in a lot of years and a lot of work. Uh, I valued every day of it, um, but it was, you know, contrary to what a lot of people thought, because it was cartooning, humor based, and irreverent. That there couldn't be a more fun job. But for me, it was always work. So yeah, uh, explain a little bit your the, your creative process. How did you? How did you approach the job? Uh, well, I, th I felt like uh, preparation was probably the most important part of the creative process. And preparation for creativity, at least in terms of editorial cartooning, is uh, know what you're talking about. So I would just read everything all the time and try to be as informed as I could. The problem was I was covering every single subject in a newspaper and so I couldn't be an expert on everything, but I did, got as close as I could humanly get. Then having prepared that way, I would uh, be ready to play, uh, to use a sports cliche. I would show up, I would be the first guy in the office. I'd be raring to go. I would uh, produce four individual uh, rough sketches of completely different cartoons just to get one out of that four. So I, I approached it uh, with full seriousness, a ton of energy, and uh, it, was, it was a task. Yeah I, yeah, I can remember when you were at the news, you, you, you're right, you were the first one. First one in, probably first one out, but it was, <laughs> yeah. but it was, it was a packed, uh, it was a packed uh, day for you. Yeah. Um, what's the future of editorial cartooning? There's... There's fewer and fewer. I had, I had you and Adam Ziglitz at an event, uh, investigative post event, a couple of years back, and uh, you guys talked about how uh, it's a it's a if not a dying art, it's a 
It's a struggling art. Um, what's uh, the, what's the future? Well, it's it's in the context of what's the fu- future of journalism. Uh, editorial cartooning has suffered at roughly the same, only at an accelerated rate compared to all local journalists. Um, Editorial cartooning is traditionally a locally based job, and as local newspapers have cut staff, editorial cartoons and the people who produce them has seemed like an expendable thing as a lot of uh, hard, yeah. hard news reporters. Yeah. A lot of journalists have, yes, have yeah. heard the same thing. Oh, we, we, we have a different way of doing this now. Well, it's, it's, it, it, it the future of editorial cartooning, I would say, is similar to the future of local journalism. Needs another, a new economic model, how, what that will be. Maybe you're providing part of the answer yourself here at the Investigative Post. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea that there will never be a demand for satire or visual satire is a little like saying, well, there will never be a demand for news. Well, people cannot live. I would say the news is more essential by a lot. Uh, people cannot conduct their lives, especially in a democratic society, without real information. Can't be done. And uh, opinion journalism can be a critical part of that, and good cartooning can be an awesome asset to that but it's it's fundamentally i think just the economics of journalism that has suffered so badly that is hurting editorial cartooning so badly all right let's uh let's look back at your career you started out the well you actually started out the spectrum at the university of buffalo right went on to the buffalo career express uh on to the buffalo news and on to the washington post um, what was your most productive period? Uh, or well, your favorite period? All uh, right. Multiple well, choice. Uh, you know, my first job was, I at least remember it through the mist of time as being the most fun and that being the career? at the Courier Express. I mean, it was a ragtag kind of uh, dysfunctional uh, news operation with some of the great traditions of old school, uh, fedora, press tag in the in the hat band journalism, uh, some crazy younger people, a very eccentric editor yeah, who Doug, Doug yeah, Turner, yeah. yes, who was uh, as eccentric a news editor as you could find. But on the on the other hand, he's maybe the only one that would have hired me to do what. I got hired to do, which was essentially political cartooning. And anyway, uh, it was, uh, it was, it it just was a scrappy, bad news bearer kind of operation. Uh, always seemed a little economically marginal, even back then, and eventually went out of business, and that was that. So that, I think, still remains, it is, my fondest memory, whether it was really accurate or not, I don't know. As far as productivity, I've been pretty productive all along. I I would say maybe my last four years were in some ways my most productive. I had been writing a blog uh, every day since, I don't know, at least for 10 years. And I started illustrating them also. And I went even so far as to come up with a new logo for the blog every single day and building it into the illustration. And I spent a fair bit of time, and I thought I was doing a pretty nice blog. I don't know that anyone was actually reading it, but it was it was pretty good quality stuff for uh, a daily production on top of my editorial cartoon. Yeah, that sounds... <laughs> I wondered how you were doing it. Uh, look, the shift from... The Buffalo News to the Washington Post. I mean, you suc- you you succeeded a, a legend, a legend. Um, what cult was there a culture shock involved with going to the Post? Um, I would say the culture shock. The generally newsrooms, in my limited experience, seem to 
be similar to each other. So there was not so much a culture shock as the way things worked. Uh, I did step into the job of a guy who had a huge reputation, a huge following, um, and a lot of readers who just loved and revered everything he did. So I, there was a high bit of skepticism. I felt like I didn't need to try to uh, fill his shoes. I showed up with my own shoes, <laughs> and they fit me just fine. Or sandals. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I just did it the way I was going to do it, which is how I'd always done it, and I would either find an audience or I didn't. I did hear that most people, you know, I would hear, well, I didn't think anybody could replace her block, but uh, you're doing a great job. That now, you sort of you wound up being syndicated in how many papers nationally? Uh, it, I think at the high point, it was maybe 250, so it was a lot. Yeah. Um, syndication, now, of course, suffered like everything else in journalism. Yeah. Now, have, have you been replaced at the Post? Not exactly. Um, they have somebody that is doing um, not really full-time cartooning. He's not doing as much as I was doing. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> what was the best cartoon you ever drew? Now, you uh, weren't a Pulitzer, so maybe it was yeah, one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or um, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, it's different cartoons are good in different ways. I think now, honestly, my favorite cartoon that I did was the last one I did because it was sort of a wrap-up of my career. It included, uh, I, I took one uh, told you so, I made a prediction about the future, I said that I, when I was five years old, that I vowed to myself that I would survive school and I would survive work and eventually get back to full-time playing, which I now have. <laughs> We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. It's 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 actually a lot of hard work playing, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, all right. So let me ask you this: um, You won a Pulitzer with the news um, in 1990. I can still remember you riding through the newsroom on a unicycle with your Pulitzer Prize. Very mm -hmm. out of character for the introverted Tom Tolls at the time. Um, are you disappointed you didn't win another one at the Post? Uh, I think, honestly, I would have liked to. It seemed more important while I was there than it does now, honestly. Um, I got such a big shelf load of awards. I was always a little skeptical about the, the nature of awards, their impact on... Yeah, but a Pulitzer's a Pulitzer. Pulitzer's a Pulitzer. I, I, I honestly, I would say I was more surprised than disappointed. I... I was doing great work at the Post for 18 years, and why they chose not to recognize that is a question I think maybe you should pose to them sometime. Okay. Um, who was the uh, multiple choice question here? Who are the easiest and hardest people to draw in Lampoon? I mean, who... who? All right, well, I'll start with hard. Um, Obama was not that hard to draw, but he was hard to lampoon because I w was very much disinclined to lampoon him. I thought, uh, all in all, you know, I, looking back now, I could, I could come up with a reasonably lengthy critique of things that I would wish he had done differently. But at the time, it seemed like he was performing you know, well in the job. I was sympathetic to most of the things he was trying to do. And I mean, in, in honesty, I just thought it was so important for the United States to, to, if the possibility existed for a successful black American presidency, I just wasn't inclined to try to claw away at that. So it was difficult to uh, both be honest and um, in any way whatsoever supportive because it's not a job of a, of a political cartoonist to be supportive. And I wasn't overtly supportive 
supportive. But trying to not take cheap shots, which is sort of part of cartooning, is to take cheap-ish shots that are actually based on something. But still, it's satire. It's not like reasoned, always... Uh, yeah, it's not fact-based reporting. It's not that. Who is, who, is, uh, who is the easiest to tee off on? Well... I would say so many targets. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I, I would say bracketing my political career, there was Ronald Reagan up front and Donald Trump on the back end, so to speak. Uh, Ronald Reagan was that was a interesting presidency. It was uh, I I cartooned him as a buffoon. And he certainly mentally performed like one, but and so it was very easy to uh, come up with material and approaches that I felt were effective and uh, deserved. I think in retrospect, re retrospect on the Reagan presidency, I underestimated a little bit because you don't know the future how important a figure he turned out to represent in right-wing politics and that he was sort of the George Washington of the, the parade of figures that led us to uh, Donald Trump. And closing with Donald Trump, I, as I said, I stayed on the job to do one thing and one thing only, and that was everything I could do to make sure that he didn't get reelected. Now, I, I will not claim even one vote in, as a result of what I did, but that was my intentionality. Now, you, you drew, um, you had a very distinct way of drawing Trump. His nose was a pig snout. I mean, it was very, um, very uh, kind of in your face. What, how, how did you decide, I just, how did you decide that yeah, look? No, I mean, it was, it's, it's not a fully conscious uh, process. It's, it's somewhat intuitive. The, the, the message I was trying to convey there was this is a, a vile human being that has no business in the White House and that uh, he doesn't deserve to be there. He's a dangerous figure. He's a repulsive figure and an immoral figure and I pushed the caricature as far in those directions as I felt I could go without it just being a festival of ugliness, which nobody's going to look at. I mean, I pushed it as far as I felt I could go and still get the message across. Okay. All right, so you retired, um, going on two years. Um, what are you doing with yourself these days? Um well, I, the the facile answer would be I'm playing like I did before I went to kindergarten. But um, my uh, idea of playing is is a little bit more complicated than that. I've started. I've shifted from uh, graphic arts to I've started doing a little sculpting, which I had always wanted to do, which is fun. My wife and I bought a large farm with a large house. Uh, that is a huge project. I find the now that's that's what south of Washington, yes. north of Richmond. Yes, uh, it the the pictures. It, it's a beautiful it's a, place. Uh, uh, just describe the house. How many bedrooms? Okay. How many square it's feet? A, how many a, acres? Yeah, it's a it's a big old ten bedroom uh, farmhouse, brick farmhouse on forty acres of land. Um, built built when. The original part of the house was built in the late 1700s, and the the largest part of the brick part of the house was built about exactly 100 years ago in 1921, 22. Um, so that needed a ton of work, uh, which we've been doing, but it's so, after sitting at a desk and scratching away at a little tiny square, it is so gratifying and enjoyable for me to work with my whole body and just do stuff. Uh, I, the body was designed to be used. I'm using it. I get to d combine functional repairs with aesthetic uh, choices. I've always been inclined to make 
things wherever I am more beautiful. I'm hoping that we're doing that both inside and outside uh, the areas around the house. Farther out, there's some horses and some hay, but in closer to the house, there's a lot of gardens that I'm working on to make it look really pretty. I would like to, and we've done a little bit of this, uh, uh, use the house for retreats, both arts kind of retreats, ideas retreats, uh, wellness, and that sort of thing. So it's, I, I mean, I have some particular ideas of what, how, where the world is going right now, and I would like to participate at least a little bit in uh, that process moving forward. Now, you never sold the house in Hamburg. Right. Uh, and you've post allowed you to work summers from Buffalo. I yeah, I was a pioneer in remote work. They, <laughs> when I when I took the job at the post, I just did not want to leave Western New York. Uh, we kept our house here. I negotiated that I could work here from summers, on in, during the summers, and it was one of the best decisions I have ever made. I we were able to keep our connections here, watch the rebirth of the city and uh, keep a lot of great friends here, and we hope to, to do that forever. So you're back here, what, two, three months out of the year? Yeah, and uh, but we, now we come back uh, more frequently on a sporadic basis because, you know, I, my schedule is easier. Now, you're, you're also, your part-time gig is, is a musician. Um, so talk to me a little bit about that because... Um, that's quite a departure from, yeah, from what you were doing. It's, so it's creative in a in a similar but very different way. Music and visual arts are uh, similar in that they're creative and intuitive and emotional, as well as cerebral. Uh, but they use really different parts of the brain. And to uh, and the other thing that's different about music is I've done it is parts of bands where then it's collaboration. I've, been, I've played now with, I don't know, 25 or 30 p different musicians on a fairly regular basis, not all at once. Um, and the collaborative musical process, when it's, when it's working, it, it's, it's a type of joy that's pretty hard to duplicate in any other activity. Yeah, um, yeah you're, a, you're a drummer too, uh, and, yeah. and a singer. Yeah. So that, that's kind My of My joke there is I'm um, one of the world's uh, worst drummers and one of the world's worst singers, but still uh, one of the world's best drummer singers because <laughs> there aren't very many of those. <laughs> All right, so you come back. You're kind of, uh, how does Buffalo look over the years? Uh, you, you know, you left at a time when Buffalo was still in pretty rough shape. Well, um, Buffalo suffered like two big uh, wa economic wallops. One was the the loss of shipping that I think was a great deal part of the well and canals construction, and uh, then uh, the just the the change of markets and labor. Uh, we lost like all our manufacturing jobs, or such a huge number of them. Uh, first to different parts of the United States, then over the overseas. I mean, this is not a story unique to Buffalo. It's unique. I mean, it's common all through the Northeast and parts of the Midwest. And it just, the, the air was just sucked out of the room here. And the it was just a tragedy to see a, a great city gasping for breath. And now it's, uh, again, not unique to Buffalo, but mid-sized cities in the Rust, well, former Rust Belt and elsewhere are coming back into their own as places people want to be. And there's a vibrancy, an energy, a self-confidence, a joy that just wasn't there before. And it's, it's so gratifying because my whole life I just hoped and wished that I would live long enough to see that happen. And to a great d degree it has. All right, let's, let's, shift, uh, uh, let's shift to the national scene. Um, I'm just going to throw out a few words and let you, uh, <laughs> let you go. Uh, Joe Biden, 
Donald Trump, the radical right. Uh, what do you make of it all? Um, we, I, my short answer is it's we've walked off the edge of the map. It, the old maps uh, apocryphally had a zone called There Be Dragons where no one knew where things, what was out there. And that's where we are. We are in a new, unprecedented uh, area of danger uh, to the American democracy that I don't, I read a fair bit of history. I don't, I mean, other than the Civil War, which was a immediate uh, and literal threat to the American nation, uh, it, there really hasn't any, been anything like this. I mean, to me, it's, it's like Joe Biden, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're like seeing if we can just walk it back to how it had been. Um, his presidency is is a kind of a relatively ordinary, safe, dem democratic mainstream. I don't. I find myself. Uh, I know Joe Biden is not is not the most popular president. I, to me, he seems like he's doing pretty well in the in the macro sense, given the cards he's playing with. Donald Trump is to me is like a heart attack that the nation had and um, you know they say that you don't ever really fully recover from a heart attack you survive it and then you start taking steps at best to put together uh, a healthy life but there's always damage that was done that never goes away and and the fact that he walked into that White House after taking the oath of office um, he represents a strain of politics that does not recognize, I mean, among many other things, the strain of politics he represented doesn't, rep, doesn't recognize the uh, existence or value of a true statement. And you know, talking to a journalist, that's, that's the that's the cornerstone of everything. You take the, a recognition and an appreciation for truth away, and you have no moorings anymore. It's just anything can happen. All the rules have no meaning. Um, this is dangerous. Now, this is in, on top of or underneath all his uh, racial signaling, which is another kind of poison that he's been uh, introducing in doses, huge doses into the American uh, political discourse. And um, so he was not a president of, like other presidents, he was, he was damaged, he was like cancer, and we got him out, we'll see uh, whether we can recover now. Uh, All right, um, one final question. What does the future look like 10 years from now? Okay, that's interesting. All right. Now, we've had a I I tend to I tended at the time and still tend to look at the world this way. There's a lot of particulars in the newspaper and a news story all the time, but they don't make full sense unless you can put them into a larger context. Now, the context that the next 10 years I put that into, there's a couple things. Politically, we're in, in, we're in the flashing yellow zone. We are in no man's land. We don't know, we don't know whether Trump will, in retrospect, turn out to have been a one-time event or whether the forces that brought him into office have uh, enough support going forward that we're in for an, another bout of uh, Trumpism, whether it's under his name or someone else's. I mean, the, the, the toxins are still out there. Okay, so politically, we're unknow it's unknowable. 
economically, it's another unknowable. We've been in the era of globalization and neoliberal economics. Um, it has produced a lot of wealth. A lot of people have gone, especially in China, have gone from like peasant status to middle class. You can point to a lot of um, benefits that we've experienced. It's also come at some significant costs. And I think the, the one, one of those costs is uh, the dislocation of globalization. There have been a lot of jobs lost here or changed into other kind of jobs, sometimes lower paying jobs. And I think part of that globalization process and the insecurity and the instability and the and the loss of of uh, sense of um, stability is one of the one of the fuels to uh, the the Trump supporters. That's that's debatable. Okay, so you've got two unknowns. You've got the you've got the uh, pol political situation very un unclear. You've got the economic situation. It's still the neoliberal era. We're still going strong on that. We had a, a, a bad stumble in 2008, but we seem to have come, come back from that. How long that goes, I don't know. No one knows. But there are two things, two very big things, that we do know very much what's coming, and neither one have we prepared for. And if you... If, uh, if anyone listening to this is looking for something to think about, well, I've got two things that you should be thinking about. One is not going to be a surprise. I've been, I've been harping on it since the late 80s, and that's climate change. We have um, so botched that threat that it's, it's disheartening and infuriating, and I will not go into laying blame for that, but there's plenty to go around. But the one that's the one, the new one, which like climate change, all the information we need to see it coming is there, and like climate change, everybody's closing their eyes to the implications. Um, but that's artificial intelligence. This one comes, unlike climate change, with a great deal of potential upside and some pretty scary scenarios of job losses and purpose losses. AI in the next 10 years will be able to do anything, anything that humans can do and probably 10, 100, 1,000 times better. Now, and the, the, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, oh, AI is, can't quite drive down the highway yet without bumping into a truck. You know, this is all just... Uh, purposeless uh, fly specking. The trends, uh, you read about what machine learning can already do, it's just staggering. Um, in 10 years, uh, you know, every single job is going to change. Every, every single job? Every single job. A doctor could have replaced a surgeon? For sure. I mean, take to take a non-surgeon doctor, for example, because that's a great example. What does a doctor do? Essentially, a patient comes in and they're sick, and the doctor diagnoses that. Well, what does diagnosis consist of? It's just a flow chart, and that's exactly the kind of thing. What are, what's, what are the symptoms presenting? What do those symptoms possibly mean? What are the case histories of p other people with those things? And not only can a computer uh, do that well, it can also simultaneously have in mind every single case that has any of those symptoms from the beginning of when case history started to be written down. No doctor has that kind of uh, mental capacity. Everything a doctor does in the office will be easily replicated and probably is already started. I mean, I think they spend, doctors now spend a lot of time using artificial intelligence to back up their diagnosis. But essentially, you will only need an interface that, and that could be a machine asking you, um, 
what are your symptoms and if this the algorithm gets to a point where it could be this or it could be this you got to find out this next piece of information all that stuff can be done mechanically surgery doctors are already using robotic assistance to steady their hands and get into smaller and smaller places you don't need you will not need the human behind that because with machine learning all they have to do all they they gave a, a, an imperfect but telling example is they gave machine learning uh, just the rules of chess they didn't give it any guidance on opening moves or strategies or end games nothing they just gave it the rules and say go ahead play it play it a billion times and it worked through and it got to grandmaster status in like a day and that's just you have one computer that learns that you can share that instantly with a million computers so anything that one computer learns how to do all of them will be able to do that and the speed of analysis is still doubling every few years so even if you look at where we are now and say well here are the limitations well when you double the speed and then double it again and then double it again you're going one two four eight sixteen you're not just on a trend line that's flat you're on a spiking trend line anyway this is going to change everything a lot of upside potential for people to actually not have to work so much a lot of downside potential in that job losses and income loss presents a huge challenge for society to digest. It sounds like you see the future is <clears throat> uncertain and not necessarily, not necessarily, um, not necessarily um, on the upside. Well, I, I choose to see AI as potentially a benefit. Climate change, on the other hand, we've got still a huge amount of work to do. All right, well, Tom, <clears throat> thank you for your insights, your history. Um, you're going back to Virginia soon. Um, it'll be, by the time you get there, it'll probably be uh, nice there. And, starting to cool here yeah it gets very hot there in the summer but i wanted to take the opportunity to not just say uh thank for having me but thank you for the work you and investigative post does for both for journalism and for the buffalo community there's it's an irreplaceable plus it is um the lifeblood as i said earlier you can't do anything um in terms of civic life without truth, and especially truth as to what's being um, done improperly. And this is uh, its solid gold that you're giving to uh, Western New York every day. And I not only am thankful, but everybody listening should be pretty darn thankful too. Well, thank you for those kind words. Thanks for your time, Tom. Great having uh, having been here.